Fala, galera! Estamos chegando para mais uma live. Sejam muito bem-vindos. Prazer muito grande estar aqui com vocês de novo. Hoje a live vai ser em inglês. So, uh, this live streaming number 58 today is September 2nd, 2020. Now it's uh, 7 p.m. And, uh, well, this is a very special moment. This is our first live streaming in English. And I have the privilege to talk with one of the best authors and speakers in our tribe, uh, Robert C. Martin. Hey, Robert. How are you doing, my friend? I'm well, thank you for having me. This, this sounds like it's going to be fun. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming. May I call you Bob? What of you course, prefer? of course. Great, great. So be very welcome to the channel. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, thanks a lot for coming. I, I did not believe when, when, when Angela confirmed it. Oh, let's do next week. Of course, let's do next week. And there is something that I'd like to ask you. Is it your first time speaking to a Brazilian audience? Mm, um, probably. Um, probably the first time I've done any kind of anything like this to a Brazilian audience. I did do some uh, teaching and consulting in Sao Paulo hey, 15 years ago, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so have you been to Brazil once, twice? Just the once, just the once. Yeah. I'd love to come again, but n n I've never had the opportunity since. You know that you know, yesterday, yesterday, no, I, I think two days ago, I posted on Twitter uh, saying that you are gonna be on our last or next live streaming and seriously uh, i had more than 200 hit tweets and a thousand <laughs> likes and dozens <laughs> of private messages on instagram and twitter and facebook and people say are oh, seriously uh, robert martin d robert martin uncle bob and i say <laughs> yeah yeah that's the man uh you know that everybody admires a lot your work especially clean code i think i have my copy here in, in <laughs> brazilian in brazilian portuguese um, which in my opinion is a very unique and special book because when you read books related to languages or frameworks libraries uh, okay uh, that's fine you end up with knowledge but after you read clean code is really like a, a shocking experience it really <laughs> changed, changed the way you see the profession you know? i hope so that was the intent <laughs> and uh in your opinion what do you think that means uh something that you always say like being a professional in our area what does it mean to be a professional yeah um a professional is someone who professes something <laughs> And typically what they profess is a, a set of standards and disciplines and ethics, primarily the ethics, <laughs> along with um, a set of practices or disciplines that they promise to follow. So doctors, for example, have a set of ethics that underlies everything they do, the Hippocratic Oath, right? First, do no harm. Uh, but then they associate with that a set of practices. For example, they all wash their hands. You know, and they wear masks in the operating room and so on. And those are just the, the, the normal disciplines that are associated with being a professional, with professing some kind of ethics. Now, we as programmers don't do any of that. We don't profess anything. There is, there is no ethics that we adhere to. There's no rules. There's there's hardly any disciplines. There's there's no standards. Uh, mostly we just kind of write code. And uh, you know, if our boss tells us it's got to be done on Tuesday, well, we, we do what we have to do to get it done on Tuesday. That is not the way a professional behaves. <laughs> <laughs> now make a lot of sense. And <clears throat> tell me something. How did you? start your career because you have been a programmer for the last i don't know 30 40 years yeah 50 something <laughs> <laughs> how did i start my career well let me show you yeah let me see let me show you how i started my career ah, when i was 12 years old my mother bought for me 
this little plastic computer. It was a birthday present. Uh, a, a little computer. You can see it's got bits on there. Go from one to zero. <laughs> it's got three bits. Uh, and the little sliders here are little flip-flops that flip back and forth. It's got uh, AND gates. That's what these little rods are here. See these six little rods? Those are AND gates. They can sense the state of the flip-flops. And there's a little mechanism up here that will, if I crank this little lever here, will change the state of those flip-flops if I had it all put together, which right now I don't. And it turns out that you can program this machine by sticking little tubes on these pegs here. Uh, and that will block these little rods from falling into the little slots and, you know, makes the AND gates work. So in essence, this is a three-bit finite state machine, which you can program with six AND gates to count. It'll count in binary from zero to seven and then back to zero again. You can make it count down in the opposite direction. You can make it add two bits, producing a sum bit and a carry bit. You can make it multiply. That's easy because that's just an AND operation. And there's several other little things that this little machine can do. And at the age of 12, it completely fascinated me. I wanted to know how this thing worked. I wanted to know how to make it do what I wanted it to do. And so I studied it for a very long time and I couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure out how to make it work. But there was a... Um, there was a little paragraph at the end of the manual that said, if you want to know how to program your computer, write to us and we will send you the advanced programming manual. Let me show you. <laughs> the advanced programming manual. There it is. I keep it in a little Ziploc bag, right? It's been in that Ziploc bag for well, 30 years or so. Um, and, of course, I got it over 50 years ago. I got it in 1964. And in inside this book is a little description, probably the most competent description I have ever read, of basic Boolean algebra. And I started reading it, and I understood it. And it, it, it showed me about Venn diagrams and Carnot maps and state diagrams and Boolean variables and 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 or and XOR and not and and De Morgan's theorem, and showed showed me how to manipulate Boolean variables and Boolean algebra. And then at the end, it said, look, if you want to program your little machine, what you do is you write down the truth table of how the bits change. You turn that into a set of Boolean equations. You reduce them to lowest terms using Boolean algebra. And here's a little table for how you put the dudes on the pegs. So I had a little program that I wanted to write. I called it Mr. Patterson's Computerized Gate. And I wrote down the bit transition table, and I turned it into Boolean equations, and I reduced all the Boolean equations to lowest terms, and I put the little tubes on the pegs, and I cycled that machine, and that machine did exactly what I wanted it to do. And I was a programmer. That was it. <laughs> it <is. laughs> I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, Bob? Uh, the beginning of my career. That there, there are... Uh, a thousand viewers right now. Have, have, well, have a thousand viewers. How are you? A thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and tell, uh, tell me something. Uh, what was your first programming language? Uh, in which platform you wrote your first programs? So, I mean, this you got to go way back in time here. And and I'm 14 years old. My father is a science teacher. He takes me on a tour along with all of his students. This was summertime, and, and he did this a lot. Uh, and he takes me on a tour of a pharmaceutical company near here. And I didn't care about the pharmaceutical stuff. That, was, that didn't interest me at all. But in the corner, there was a teletype. And there was a guy typing on that teletype. And he was typing in basic. Now, the teletype was connected by a modem line to a general electric computer somewhere probably in Virginia. This was during the era when, when general electric had, oh, six or seven uh, installations of general electric computers that they sent modem lines out to laboratories. Uh, that was the way people got uh, their computers in those days. It was just a, a very slow 110, you know, baud kind of connection, 10 character per second connection. 
I watched that guy. I just watched him. <laughs> and I could see what he was typing. I didn't know basic, but I could see what he was typing. And I kind of worked it out as he was typing. It kind of worked out because it's a simple language. Kind of worked it out. And then I went home and I started writing a whole bunch of basic programs that I could not execute. <laughs> I, I did not have any way to execute these programs, but I wrote them anyway because I was just so convinced that I wanted to be a programmer. <laughs> That was the, the first real executable computer language that I saw. There were several others that came later, but that was the first. And I was probably 13. <laughs> Maybe 14, so, I'm not sure what so uh, like the first the, the first versions of basic because I saw I saw on your on your picture a Commodore, I think, PET uh 4000 uh Oh yes, that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in a different the other one. one. The, I don't this have is, that one here. This is the six, the sixty four. You are going to I've grab sixty four here. My my Commodore sixty four sits right here. Uh, I've got maybe. it under a nice plastic case, but you know, there's the Commodore sixty four. Poor thing doesn't work anymore. Ah, perfect. Working. I don't know why. I tried to power it up a while ago, and it just kind of made a funny noise. And I figured, okay, I better not mess with it. I suppose I could open it up and, and fiddle around, but I don't really feel like doing that. So I did spend a lot of time working on this, although I was in my 30s when I got this machine. So yeah. I'm already a programmer and doing lots of work in C and things like that. But, you know, nice little basic computer. Good for the day. Really fast for yeah. for eight, uh, I think, eight hundred dollars. <laughs> That's okay. It was very, it was very inexpensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course, comparing to those huge computers at that time. But uh, but in your first experience, you you wrote a lot of code by hand on paper, no? Oh yeah, that's how we that's how we wrote everything. I, I mean, let me show you something here. Let me see if I've got it here. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> you're making me get all my stuff out here. Let's see. Mm. The first job I ever had as a programmer was at a company called ASC Tabulating Corporation. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I was 18 years old. And this is what we wrote our code on. And if, if you look carefully, you'll see it's uh, got 80 columns across, right? That's for punch cards. These yeah. things, you know, these things here. <laughs> punch cards Perfect. so you would uh, you would write your code on these in these little boxes uh, and you would write it in pencil the uh, the editor you used was an eraser and uh, you'd be very very careful to write your code I've got a nice little pad of these things here and it's coding forms and then um, once you had written the code you'd check it over very carefully <laughs> because it's you, in those days you couldn't just compile it you had to kind of check it and check it. And then you would take your pages and you would hand them to um, the people who would punch the cards, the, the key punch operators. And the key punch operators did not like the programmers at all because the programmers <laughs> would walk into the key punch room with more work for them to do. And these guys were busy. You know, these, these people had to had to punch all the data that was going into the computer in those days. Data went into the computer on cards. That was it. Yeah. It wasn't exactly. any other way. So they had to punch everything. If there was an inventory thing to do, they were punching all the inventory crap. If there was payroll stuff to do, they were punching all the time cards. And so, you know, programmers would walk into their room and say, would you please punch my program for me? And they hated it. They hated it. Now, I was 18 years old, and I was not a, an imposing character at the time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I walked into that room one day, and, and there was a woman in there, and she probably 45, and she just stared me down. And she said, flutter away, little butterfly. Those words <laughs> are burned into my brain. And I, I ran out of that room with my tail between my legs. And I went down into the basement of the office building I was in where there was a spare key punch machine. And I sat at that damn machine and I taught myself to type. 
And that was, I never went back into that key punch room again. They were <laughs> too scary. From that moment on, I, I punched, I typed every one of the programs that I wrote. Those machines were fascinating. There was no lowercase. It was all uppercase. Oh, great. All code was written in uppercase. <laughs> like to reduce the amount of bits that you yes, need to that combine. Was entirely the issue that we didn't have enough bits. There are not enough holes on yeah, the to represent the letters. Yeah. To represent lowercase characters. Okay. So, so, you know, everything was uppercase. It, it's it like uh, five, five bits. Six bits? Well, it started as five yeah. in the very, very early days. There, Then it went to eight. And there's enough room in eight bits to have upper and lower case. Yeah. But the machines did not move as fast as the data formats. So for a very long time, it just stayed upper case. We stayed with, a, with the character set that was designed for five bits, even though we were using eight-bit media. <laughs> and uh, is so, it like ASCII or... Another form. Eventually, ASCII came along, and the punch cards were in the uh, mm. the IBM format, which was called EBCDIC, uh, Extended Binary Coded Decimal Interchange Code. <laughs> that was because IBM IBM made this conscious decision right around 1961 or 62 that uh, business did everything in decimal. And yeah. therefore, their computers should be decimal machines. So some of the really early IBM machines operated in decimal, right? They had they had bits, they had binary bits, but they would separate them into groups of four and use this code called binary coded decimal, which meant they ignored, you know, six of the possible bit combinations. And then they would do all their math in decimal. All the circuitry was done in, was to do the math in decimal. Those machines... Um, there was a machine called a 1401. It had 4K of core, core memory. But it was not 4096. It was 4,000 bytes because it was a decimal machine. And how, how you keep track of changes like programming on paper, how you refactor the code you written on paper, that, that's crazy, huh? You didn't refactor a thing. <laughs> In those days, in those days, once it worked, it was like, okay, it works. Don't mess with it. Because a, a compile in those days took 24 hours. Yeah. You know, you'd have to take your deck to the computer room. You couldn't go into the computer room. They didn't let you touch the computer. You know, the, the operators operated the computer. Programmers were like, you know, peons. You couldn't go near the computer. So you'd have to hand the deck to the operators, and then it would just sit in the computer room until three in the morning, because the the operators were, were busy running the real programs, you know, the business programs. They were doing general <laughs> ledgers, they were doing payrolls, they were doing stuff like that. Um, and at three in the morning, finally, when they'd run out of work, they take all the programmers' decks and stick them in the card reader, and uh, punch the button. Then they'd go get coffee, and they'd come up an hour later and tear off all the listings. And, put them out on a table outside. And as a programmer, you'd go back the next day and you'd see your listing there and you'd, you'd take it to your desk and open it up and realize you'd forgotten a comma. And that was the life of a programmer. You, you got one compile a day if you were lucky. Yeah. So the way we got, the way we made ourselves efficient was to work on 10 programs simultaneously. Oh, great. So it's like a cycle. When you are yeah. writing some code, the other uh, is being compiled and the yeah. other is running. And, and at the time in 60s and 70s, when did you actually realize it, that the quality of the code is so important? Because I believe that at that time, writing code on paper, uh, it doesn't matter if you write a variable like result or, I don't know, aux temp. When you, did you realize, look, the quality of code is actually important. Well, we always kind of had a feeling about that, but we didn't really know what to do about it because there was no way to modify your code uh, with any kind of efficiency. So once you got it to work, touching it was very dangerous. We always thought, you know, maybe there's maybe this code is a little ugly, but I'm not going to mess with it because if I mess with it, I'll break it and it'll take me days to fix it. So, you know, we we were very, very careful about this. 
And then the size of the programs that we were dealing with were relatively small. You know, a, th a thousand lines. Here, let me show you. All right, got a lot of good opportunity to show you things here. Here. Literally inside a box. <laughs> That's, you know, well, this is about maybe a, a 1,500 lines cut. Literally a package. You have a package. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the box can hold 2,000 cards. Yeah. So what you're looking at here is 2,000 lines, right? Now, yeah. if this had 2,000 cards in it, it would weigh 40 pounds. <laughs> My goodness. So, so, you know, if you had a 10,000 line program, why you're talking about, you know, what is it, 400 pounds of cards? <laughs> cards. So you can't just kind of carry that down to the card reader and do a compile. Yeah. So the, the sizes of our programs were generally pretty small, which meant that making the code readable, although we, you know, we'd look at it and go, eh, it's kind of ugly, but it didn't matter that much because there was only 500 lines of code, 700 yeah. lines of code, something like that. The years went by, and bit by bit, those programs got longer and longer and longer. So, <laughs> so you know, I'm working at that first that first company, and and we, um, you know, the, the programs I wrote for the big mainframe computers, they were all small. They were all little things, and I thought they were big because I was, you know, 18 years old. But ah, eh, 500 lines, 600 lines, they were hardly anything. And then they um, they asked us. And by us, I mean there was a group of high school kids. I was in high school. My friends were in high school. We were all computer nerds before there were any computer nerds. And we all got jobs at this place. <laughs> How weird is that? And um, they asked us to write a system uh, on a mini computer. And they got a mini computer and they dedicated it to us. So we had a computer available to us. 24 7 and and it was 24 7 too i mean we were there at all hours because my god you give 18 year olds a machine they're going to be there yeah or at least we would so you know we're still using punch cards but now we had this machine available to us and we could write much larger programs and eventually we learned ways to take the cards and put them on magnetic tape mm -hmm. that we could edit on magnetic tape that was a painful process but it meant that we weren't carrying cards around and we could have 10,000 line programs on a reel of magnetic tape. That was, that was pretty, that was pretty convenient. You could also make copies of the magnetic tape. That was also very convenient because making copies of cards is a pain. And bit was in a PDP-8? Oh, the source code, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. We had our own dedicated computer. We had the medium we could use and we started to learn about the structure of code and why the structure of code was important as you get into larger and larger programs. Yeah. It was in the PDP-8 in which mini computer? The, that mini computer was a Varian 620F, <laughs> which <laughs> you've never heard of and nobody's ever heard of. Yeah. It was a, a product in, in the, in the uh, early 70s. The idea of mini computers had been born. You see this thing in the back wall here. You know, that's a PDP-8L. Yeah. That's the yeah. first panel to a PDP-8L. This little blinky thing here, that's a, a simulator for a PDP-8. These machines started to get produced in the late 60s and the early 70s. And once they got, once they started to be produced, everybody and their uncle started making them. I mean, the companies just came out of the woodwork. Everybody was making these computers. Only a few of those companies survived. So you get to be about 1975 and the whole market has settled out and digital equipment is the one making the mini computers. And there's a few others, Apple. Apple hadn't been born yet, but there were other companies that were making. Hewlett Packard started making some and a few other companies. IBM tried, didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they couldn't <laughs> a mini computer. Yeah. So it, there were just a few left, but I this, this experiment at this company I was at was at the heyday when everybody was making these things.
<laughs> by the way, by the way, before we start to talking about clean code, what was your favorite home computer, like a Commodore, Sinclair, Tandy? Oh, I had uh, one of those. <laughs> Macintosh, Apple. <laughs> what a ridiculous big, question. Big I, I don't have mine anymore. I don't know what happened to it. It yeah. disappeared on me. Um, I had one of those. I had the Commodore 64, of course. Um, but I, the very, the most significant and my favorite home computer was the original Macintosh 128. Perfect. 128 came Mac. I still have it. It's at a, a different office. I keep it in a special place and it's a place of honor. It doesn't work anymore. It stopped working yeah. a while ago. <clears throat> but I did more on that than I did on any of the previous machines. Great. And after that, it was Macintoshes for me for, oh, gee, maybe 10, 15 years. Then I had to switch to PCs. That was horrible. <laughs> then I got to switch back to Macintoshes. So now I'm back on Macintoshes, and I'm Great. very happy. <laughs> Fantastic. Look, uh, in your book, in Clean Code, you brought many opinions from very famous software developers, authors like um, Grady Butch, John Strauss-Trupp, Dave Thomas, Rod Cunningham, many others, many others, Michael Fetters, yep. Dave Thomas, Ron Jeffries, yep. many others. And uh, I prefer, I actually like the words definition, which is, you know, uh, you were working on clean code when each routine, each piece, you read turns out to be pretty much what you expected. That's very that's very strong. And uh, of course, the other definitions are, are fantastic too. But what is your definition, personal definition of clean code? Wow. Uh, you know, it's odd that no one has ever asked me that question before. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I wrote to all those guys as I was writing the book. I wrote to all those guys and I asked them what their definitions of clean code were was. And I was really surprised by the answers because I got so many very interesting answers. You know, Grady Booch says, you know, clean code reads like well-written prose. Who would have thought that? Right? Or Yarna Struster. Yarna Struster says clean code does one thing well. That's a very old rule. It goes way back into the 70s. Um, but here you go. And you get all these really interesting, interesting ideas. My favorite, of course, was your favorite, Ward Cunningham's. Because Ward, I don't know if you know Ward. Ward is Ward is a really interesting guy. I mean, Ward, Ward is this guy that all the other software consultants like me look up to. He's the consultant's consultant. He's, <laughs> he's, he's you know, older than everybody in the world. And, and he's, you know, he's been a programmer forever. And his answer, which you quoted, was, you know, you know you're, you know you're reading clean code when each routine you read is pretty much what you expected. And I, I read that, and I, I thought, huh, well, you know, whatever. It didn't, it didn't hit me right away. It's like, okay, you know, thanks, Ward, whatever. <laughs> and then I thought about it for a while, and I realized that I had never read code that was pretty much what I expected. Most of the time when I read code, I'm going like, what the hell is going on in here? And... It made his statement made it clear that clean code is code that when you read it is not surprising. It it communicates to you. Michael Feather said it very well too. He said, you know, clean code looks like it was written by someone who who cares. cares. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And and it's the same, it's just the two sides of the same coin, right? If if the code comes across to you as unsurprising, and you, you as you read it, you agree with it, then you also have this feeling that the person who wrote it cared about you, cared about communicating to you. And this, this is the programmer's first obligation. Most programmers believe that their first obligation is to make the code work, and that's not right. The programmer's first obligation is to communicate with other programmers. Make sure their code communicates to everybody else because 
if I can read your code, I can make it work, even if you can't. If you leave halfway before you get it to work, I can make it work. But if you hand me a bunch of code that I can't understand, I will never make it work. When the requirements change, I will never be able to, to make the code meet the new requirements. It's much more important that the code communicate than that the code work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, that's a, a great definition. And for me, one of the foundations of clean code is something that Kent Beck, uh, I love Kent Beck work, and is defined as a value of extreme programming, which is courage. Courage, you need to have uh, enough courage to not fear the codes. And, and, and in order to, to not fear the code, you need to have tests, of course. That's the, 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 the basis. And TDD, uh, test-driven development, is more than uh, a simple technique. For me, it's like a discipline, a discipline of anxiety control. As uh, developers, we are in general very anxious. We need to see the, the result as soon as possible. And uh, it's not just only about reducing the number of bugs. It is like to, to, to short the feedback cycle, to have a fast feedback cycle where, oh, I, I wrote a line of code, I saw the result, I write another line of code, saw the result again, and, uh, and that leads to productivity. Uh, I, I do believe in those kind of uh, feedback circles, feedback loops. Yeah. And uh, however, in your opinion, how uh, what's the point about TDD? How can we stimulate developers in order to practice it? Because uh, for the majority of developers, it's pretty. Uh, although you have a lot of uh, tests, but not TDD, actually. What's the point up for you about TDD? How you see like uh, put it? Uh, in practice among the developers? Test-driven development is a discipline. And it's a difficult discipline. It's not an yeah. easy discipline to acquire. It's not an easy discipline to master. But once you have mastered it, it pays back enormously. The goal of TDD, of course, is, is your idea of courage, right? What we want is some way to be able to courageously change the code. And we cannot do that if we if we fear that the code has been broken, if we if we think that what we're doing is going to break the code, we're not going to do it. We're not going to clean it if we think we're going to break it. We're not going to make it better if we think we're going to break it. But if we have a suite of tests, and if we trust that suite of tests with our life, and if that suite of tests runs in a matter of seconds, well, then we can clean the code because we're not afraid that those tests become the courage that allow us to clean the code and clean it anytime we feel like it. That's why we do test-driven development. We do test-driven development so that we can keep control of the code. If we don't have the tests, we lose control of the code. And then the code controls us. We, who have created it, surrender our control and the code will control us. The code will tell us when we can change it and when we can't. And we will respond to it in fear. If we keep control of it with a good suite of tests, well, then we can control it. We can clean it. We can keep it well-maintained and well-structured. That's why we do it. Now, why don't more programmers do test-driven development? Because it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to learn. It's hard to master. Most programmers kind of shrug their shoulders and go, eh, I'm not going to bother with that. I've got code to write. I've got deadlines. I'm not going to mess with that. And this is the other side of courage. When Kent Beck talked about courage, it was not the courage to change the code so much. It was the courage of your convictions. What's important? This gets back to the whole professionalism thing. What are your standards? What's important? Are you going to master the code? Are you going to control the code? Or are you going to let the code control you? 
Are you going to keep productivity high by maintaining control of the code? Or are you going to allow the productivity of the entire team to sink down and get lower and lower and lower because you've lost control of the code? That takes some courage. And the courage there is the courage to do what you know must be done, which is to maintain that suite of tests. Now, how you get the suite of tests, I don't really care. It would be nice if you used one discipline or another, but getting that suite of tests is the real important thing. Test-driven development is one of the disciplines that can get you that suite of tests. Another one is Kent Beck's, what is it called? The test first? Uh, code, code test revert, something like that. And it's a very interesting discipline, right? You, you must write the code first, yeah. And then you write a little test, and then you execute the test. And if the test fails, it does a git reset hard. It erases the code. It erases the code. <laughs> so you're very careful, right? And you you work in very short steps, and you you write the test you know is going to pass. Yeah. And then you run it, and uh oh, it didn't fail. Okay, I get to keep that code. Um, that's another discipline and a very interesting one. I don't use that discipline. That's not my discipline. I use test-driven development. But I, I look at that other one and I think, well, that's an interesting discipline. The bottom line here is that if you're going to get that suite of tests that allows you to keep control of the code, you do need some kind of discipline to do it. And it's it's one of those, it has to be a discipline that you follow with a certain amount of dogma. I'm a pilot. I fly a plane. There are certain dogmas oh, yeah. that we follow. Right? Oh, great. <laughs> For a very good reason, right? You know, yeah, of course. There are checklists that you always go through. There are certain things that you always do, even though you just did it a little while ago, you still go through and do it. For very obvious reasons. We programmers need to develop that kind of sense of discipline. There are things that we just always do. <laughs> and do you do, do do you follow the three laws of TDD? Me, yeah, I yeah. do. I follow them. Now, if you were to watch me code, you would also see that I take a certain amount of liberty with them, because there are times when the three laws work very well, and there are other times when you look and think, well, I, you know, I really don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to follow this time. Yeah. And yeah. you know, as long as I don't wind up in a debugger, I feel pretty good about it. My, yeah. my, uh, my rule of thumb is that I can relax the rules until I wind up in a debugger. As soon as I'm in a debugger, I've, I've relaxed them too much and I have to tighten them back up. Debuggers are console.logs and those kind of <laughs> weird ways to, to debug the code. No? Well, usually I, I do use uh, print statements. It's, it's much, much easier for me to use a print statement to do a debugging session because the bugs that I create are are vanishingly small and stupidly simple. If you're yeah. doing test-driven development, that's just kind of the way that works. Yeah, normal. Yeah. And look, uh, perfect, fantastic. And of course, you need to keep the tests clean because as the time, the time passes, the tests end, end up uh, getting complex and more complex. So yeah, you apply refactoring techniques also to the tests. The, the tests are part of the system. You maintain them to the same degree of quality that you maintain everything else to. You refactor the tests. You clean the tests. Absolutely do. Otherwise, you'll lose control of the tests. If you lose yeah. control of the tests, you lose control of the code. <laughs> <laughs> and look, uh, in terms of code smells, uh, they end up hiding like a lot of things that lead to problems over time, like uh, classes and methods that are growing fast, or uh, if statements that's nesting. Uh, in your point of view, uh, what is the most dangerous code smells? Because uh, sometimes a variable is not uh, easy to understand its purpose, but what is the code smell or the code smells that you consider more important or dangerous? What do you think? Well, the most prevalent code smell is long method. 
<laughs> yeah. You, know, you, you look through, you know, most of the code out in the world and you see, you know, a method of 500 lines or 600 lines or 200 lines. It's just too long. And it's not the most dangerous, but it does the most damage because it's the most prevalent. Most dangerous. That's a much more interesting question because it, it has to do with writing functions that serve two masters more than yeah. one master, two or three masters. Uh, and I, that gets back to a principles called the single responsibility principle and so on, one of the solid principles. But when, when you have a, a function and that function serves these people over here, but it also serves these people over here, then it becomes possible to make a change in this function that, that answers a question or a desire that these folks over here had, but it breaks those guys. And they don't know it. And you don't know it because you, you don't even know that this function actually serves two masters. You think it's just serving those guys, right? And you're breaking some other guys. That's, the, that's the, um, the symptom of code fragility. Fragility is when you touch the code in an obvious and simple way to solve a problem for someone. And you do. You solve the problem for them but you break it for someone else. And that is, that is the most frightening of all the code symptoms out there because it's the one that managers and customers can actually see. They see yeah. it by their experience. They ask you to fix something and something else breaks. And when they see that, they know that the code's out of control. They know that the programmers have lost control of the code and they don't know what they're doing anymore because every time they touch it, it breaks something else. It's a very obvious symptom of loss of control and it, it frightens the hell out of managers and customers. They will come back at some point and they will say, all right, all right everybody stop touching the code. We're not gonna change it anymore. Nobody touched the code. And I call that official rigidity. <laughs> <laughs> Managers, you know you have failed when your boss says nobody touches that code anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, great, and look, uh, you did a, a great work with solid, the solid principles, which uh, brought us uh, a, a wider perspective about responsibility and uh, design of classes, coherence of inheritance and controlling dependency between abstractions. Uh, could you talk about solid and how did, did you come up with these concepts like together? <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's such a strange story. I was working at a company Oh, man, uh, 1986, I was working at this, eight, 1988, I was working at this company. And uh, uh, I started to get involved on the internet. Now, it's, it's important to understand, you know, in at that time, there was no real internet. There were a few high-speed connections between universities. And then everybody else would, would connect to that by dial-in. So I had a computer, I had a, a spark station where I worked, and I set it up so that it would dial into a friend's computer, and then that friend would dial into another computer, and then that friend would dial into one of the main computers on the internet, and that's how we would send email around and, and get news around. So it was very slow, very ponderous, dial-up connections, you know, and they were, they were temporary connections too. I'd dial up, I'd get all my mail, I'd get all my news, and then hang up and it would be 24 hours before I did that again. One of the things I got involved with was in a very early social network called Net News. This was uh, news groups in the early, early days. You can still find them. Google still has them out there. If you want to do a, a, a search for Net News, you'll see them. And I started arguing with people on um, news groups that had to do with software. And one of those groups was a group called comp.object. It was the discussion about object-oriented design. <clears throat> and I, I was a very frequent uh, contributor to that. I was just always, always talking, always arguing, always debating. And then one day, um, this fella, who is, was always kind of a controversial fella, um, posts something 
called The Ten Commandments of Object-Oriented Design. And as I read through it, I thought, oh, this is kind of the obvious stuff. You know, all your variables have to be private and uh, your functions are public and stuff like that. It was just the, the normal kind of obvious stuff that you'd read in a, a first book on object-oriented programming. And I thought, well, there must be deeper principles than this. There must be something that goes more to the design of a system and not just the layout of the code. My, uh, my partner and I, my business partner and I, had been working on a project for about two years in C++ at this point. And it was a, uh, a massive project. It was 36 programs, uh, sharing a reusable framework. It was all object-oriented. It was, it was a million lines of code. It was a very, very interesting and, and deep um, project. And we had learned a number of things about how to put, you know, how to how to structure code in a big system with lots of reuse and lots of abstraction. And so I started writing these things down as a response to this guy. And I, you can find that post. It's still out on there. You can still go, go Google it and you'll find it. And I wrote down, I don't know, maybe nine or so principles, just simple ones. The open closed principle was one of them. The Liskov substitution principle was another. There were several others that were in there. <clears throat> and that started a discussion. And that discussion went back and forth. And over several more years, the list of principles kind of solidified. Sorry for the joke there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, a number of, of principles that are now in the list. But okay. All right. In um, I started to teach these principles, and I, I would call them the principles of object-oriented design. I would go out and teach them, teach them, and speak about them, and and uh, talk more and more. And bit by bit, I found a few more that I that I thought were interesting, and I would add them. And then um, Michael Feathers came to me one day, and he said, "You know, <laughs> change the order. The first letter spell out the word solid." And I kind of went, "Oh yeah." <laughs> <laughs> so, so I changed it right away, and, and that's where the solid principles came from. Most of those principles are other people's principles. Bertrand Meyer and Barbara Liskoff and other people had, had named these principles years before. A couple of them are, are my own, but most of them are other people. I just kind of brought them together and gave them a name. By far the most maybe complicated is the Liskoff substitution with <laughs> which everybody like don't un quite understand. For you, what means exactly the Liskov substitution? Well, so the Liskov substitution principle, Barbara Liskov did this uh, because she's a mathematician, right? She, and, and she's working in this area of mathematics called, you know, category theory. And she wanted to, she wanted to come up with a definition for a subtype. And what is a subtype? Well, so she defines a subtype as a, a type that is used by another type. <laughs> and then there are these subtypes. And if you substitute the subtypes for the type, then the using type doesn't know the difference. That's, that was her definition of a subtype. And she, she posed it all in very mathematical language. I first ran across that concept in this book here, let's see, where is it? Ah, oh, yeah. This is Jim Copeland's Advanced C++ Programming Styles and Idioms. It was written in 1992, right? Yeah. And this, this is one of the most frightening books about C++ that you can read, right? There are things in here that you find out that C++ can do and you don't want to do them because they're just awful. But, but a fascinating book, really interesting stuff. And in here, he talks about the Liskov substitution principle. And I, and I thought, that's cool. I loved, I loved the fact that he had named it the way the physicists had named particle theory, right? The, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or the, 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 um, the, uh, ex the, the, the who's exclusion principle is it? That got it. The, uh, I don't know who's it is, a Fermi or somebody like that. Anyway. I loved the fact that he used this Liskov substitution principle. What does it mean? 
Well, in, in simple terms, it means that if you've got a program that uses a base class and you have a derived class of that base class, then the program has to be able to use the derived class without knowing that it's using the derived class. The derived class has to be substitutable for the base class. But then it starts to get complicated. Like the preconditions and post conditions, and yeah, that's what happens. You start getting the preconditions and the post conditions. So there's some contract that the base class guarantees. Well, okay, that means all the derived classes have to guarantee that contract as well. And very often, programmers forget this. <laughs> they they will write a derived class that violates the contract of the base class. And the way you do that is pretty simple. You just write, you overwrite a method, you override a method to do something that the user of the base class would not expect. Uh, so for example, um, what some people do is they'll, they'll override a method in a derived class to unconditionally throw an exception. Now, the, the user of the base class did not expect that. <laughs> the, the user of the base class expected that something would happen, something normal would happen when you call this function, but the derived class just unconditionally throws an exception because the author decided that that function should not be called in the derived case. Well, that's a substitution violation, and it will force the original using class to put an if statement in. Well, if it's the derivative, then I don't want to call that method. And that violates the open closed principle. That violates a whole bunch of principles. As soon as you have to put that if statement in, you've kind of lost control of your whole type hierarchy. So that's the Liskov substitution principle in a kind of hand wavy sense. I could go to the board and draw it for you, but I don't <laughs> think that's this kind of a talk. <laughs> By the way, uh, speaking in Jim, in Jim Copian, yeah. uh, I saw a debate uh, between you and him about PDD <laughs> like <laughs> 20 years ago. Oh, it was 15. a while ago, yeah. 15, yeah. probably, yeah. The, the disagreement was about like, I don't know, coverage or the, the concept of what is a professional developer? Uh, can't remember. Jim uh, Cope is a, um, is a really interesting fella. Um, if you've ever seen him, so so. <laughs> let me get this book out again. All right, so look at the author's name here. Yeah, James O. Copeline. Is he American? No. What's that? Is he American? Oh yeah, he's American. Yeah. Yeah, I worked at uh, at Bell Labs or AT&T for a good long time. Yeah. Um, James O. Copeland. Now, when I read that name, you know, I was 35, 36, 37, something like that. I don't know how old I was, but I looked at that name and I thought, man, that's a significant name, James O. Copeland. I had this vision of a guy who was kind of 50-something and maybe a little bit overweight and bald. <laughs> and, and he was a serious programmer. And when he spoke, everyone listened and he never cracked a joke. He was just, you know, serious. And then I meet <laughs> Jim he's Copley. Quite young, no? He's, he's, like a, he's six four. He's skinny as a rail. He's bright red head and right red hair on his face. He, he, he cannot be serious for more than 10 seconds. He's just smiley all the time and bubbly and hey, right? it's just the <laughs> opposite view of who I thought James O. Cope yeah. was. And he and I get into a number of interesting debates. So uh, there was this time, I can't remember, I think it was in Norway. I think it was in Norway. And somebody brought us together uh, and sat us together in a room and said, well, what do you guys think about X? What do you think about Y? And, you know, we're talking about it, talking about it. And, and, and then they ask, what do you think about test-driven development? And I say, well, <clears throat> I think, you know, you can't really be a professional unless you're, you're, you've got a discipline like this. You've got to have a discipline like test-driven development. And, and Cope, Cope looks at me and says, well, I guess I'm not a professional then. <laughs> yeah. That was the beginning of the debate. Yeah. After that, we thought, you know, it'd be fun to have a, a, a session where we invite people in and the two of us would just go at it <laughs> and debate this concept. So it was, it, that was what it was. It was uh, 
two guys, you know, with a lot of mutual respect and a fundamental disagreement about one thing. And we just had an absolute blast with with I, there were probably two or three hundred people in the room. We just had an absolute blast going after each other. <laughs> At the end, we gave each other a big hug and went away. <laughs> it was uh, before or after he wrote the foreword of Clean Code. Oh, what an interesting question. Um, probably before. Yeah. Probably before. Because he was still living in the U.S. He hadn't moved to Denmark yet. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. Uh, uh, I saw many times these videos. Awesome. And, and in your opinion, the solid principles um, is restricted like to OO language or it is possible to apply the ideas at least to other uh, like functional programming, structured programming. What do you think? Oh, certainly, certainly. The, the principles were written in the context of object-oriented techniques, right? So I called them the principles of object-oriented design long ago. But uh, as I began to learn functional programming and apply functional programming, I realized that the principles still apply. They apply slightly differently. Yeah. But they still apply. I mean, the open close principle is still a very obvious principle. You do want modules that are open for extension and closed for modification, regardless of what kind of paradigm you're using. And um, Liskov substitution is a little bit difficult in a in a functional programming language that does not have dynamic polymorphism. If yeah. the language has dyna dynamic polymorphism, then it fits just fine. Uh, and most of the other principles work out pretty well. Uh, the interface segregation principle is a little bit iffy, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. although it's iffy just in a dynamically typed language. Right? Interface segregation principle works best in a statically typed dynamic polymorphism language. It's like applying in JavaScript, no? <laughs> um, <laughs> like you do it in JavaScript, but it, it again, it's you know, JavaScript is a dynamically typed language, and the interface segregation principle is kind of like. You scratch your head and go, well, you know, how do I apply this in this goofy language? Uh, there's a way you can do it, but yeah. it just takes a bit of thought. Yeah, especially with TypeScript, but yeah, uh, with TypeScript. You, yeah, and we are heading to the <laughs> to the last questions, and <laughs> yeah, uh, sometimes, uh, actually, very often. Uh, the architecture of our programs get like blended, mixed with concepts like the web, the framework, the persistent layer. And you wrote uh, clean architecture, which I believe that helps like address this kind of situation. So talk a little bit about clean architecture, why you came up with this, this concept. The, uh, the, the book Clean Architecture was a result of observing many people writing software without realizing that they, how do I put this properly, without observing them to separate the things that needed to be separated. So, for example, um, it was not uncommon in the early days of Java for people to write SQL code in their uh, GUI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now, everybody knew that was bad, right? Even the ones who did it knew it was bad, but they didn't know why it was bad. Why is this bad? And as, uh, as time went on, you know, I would look at the way people were writing software and I would see, you know, the, the, the database schema from the relational database would be visible inside the business rules. The business rules would be talking about columns in the database and would be issuing queries and would actually manipulate the SQL code to change the SQL code to do a query differently. And, and again, I think everybody knew that was bad, but they didn't know why and they didn't really know what to do about it. And then came the era of the ADO. Remember the ADOs? And you know you would you would just you would get these lists of rows from from the database room and you'd pass them all around and and again the schema of the database is getting propagated everywhere the schema of the GUI is getting propagated everywhere and I thought okay I, there needs to be a book 
that explains why this is bad and what what the real goal of an architecture is. And the goal of an architecture is separation, separating the things that are not related to each other. The database is not related to the business rules. The business rules are not related to the GUI. The framework is not related to the business rules. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of things that are not related. And the fact that they're not related needs to be maintained. You have to have boundaries that separate these things that are not related so that when changes occur in one, they don't break things in the other or they don't propagate to the other. So that was really the whole point of the book, trying to trying to drive that point home, right? And the the end result of that should be a set of business rules at the core of your system that anybody could look at at the highest level and know what this system does. You look at the business rules, you look at the names of the classes or the names of the modules that, that identify the business rules and you go, oh, I know what this system is. This is an inventory system. This is a payroll system. You just know by looking at the architecture, what the system is. Is it uh, close to domain-driven design from Evans? I saw I saw the book behind you, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so Evans, Eric, you know, he talks about the idea of the separations and the boundaries. He talks yeah. about the, uh, what is it? Layered architecture. The layered and architecture. Yeah. And the, okay, very well described in here, not in the sense of the technology that I lay it out in. In my book, I talk about the code and the way you the way you structure the code to make this happen. But the concepts are all still here. This, yeah. by the way, is a tremendous book, especially yeah. the first half of it. Right? Just a, a wonderful book. If you don't have this book, I strongly urge you to get it and read it because it's very powerful. Yeah, I have my copy around here. <laughs> and look, Bob, uh, one last question uh, as uh, we are reaching one hour. And you always say that the only way to go fast is to go well. I'll always, always say. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> what is your advice your for the developers that are watching us in order to become better developers? Or, well, so my advice there is to go back to this concept of courage again. You know, who are you? Uh, what, what kind of developer are you? What are your standards? What's your ethics? What are your disciplines? Right. Uh, the only way to go fast is to go well. That means that when your boss says it's got to be done by Tuesday, you need to go well. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to get there if you don't go well. But that takes courage. That takes real courage because the, the feeling you're going to have is that you have to rush and you must suppress that. You cannot rush because if you rush, you will not make the deadline. You will blow it out. To go fast, you have to, you ever see, um, which one was it? It was, uh, it was Star Wars episode one. The one with uh, Liam Neeson being um, Wycon or something like that, right? And there's this scene where he and the, the demon are fighting, and there's a force field between them. This force field pops up between them, and the demon is pacing back and forth, <laughs> wanting to get at him. And Gwai Khan just calmly settles down and meditates. That's the, that's the message I want to give programmers. Right? When you are under the most pressure, become the most calm. Slow down, work deliberately, work carefully. The only way to go fast is to go well. <laughs> That's perfect. Bob, thank you so much. We are reaching the, the end of our talk. And I really would like to thank you so much for your time, for your work. You are definitely a huge inspiration for all of us. Uh, I speak, uh, I, I do believe for all the Brazilian developers that are watching us, uh, a thousand and almost a thousand and a half. And <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a lot of people. Huh? Uh, thank you so much, Bob. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you. 
Pessoal, muito obrigado para quem assistiu. Foi um prazer imenso, uma live histórica ter o Robert Martin aqui. É, boa noite a todos. Peço que vocês deixem seu like, se inscrevam, ativem as notificações e, principalmente, compartilhem com seus amigos, porque realmente foi um modelo... É, foi um vídeo bem histórico para a gente. Então, muito obrigado a todos. Valeu, galera. Bob, thank you so much. <risos> bye, bye, everybody.